Hello, I'm Claudia. Welcome to Learning Unit 2. Learning Unit 2 will be on an overview of Occupational Safety and Health Act 1994 in bracket Act 514. By the end of this Learning Unit 2, students will be able to understand the overview of the Occupational Safety and Health Act 1994. The Occupational Safety and Health Act 1994 or OSHA 1994, is an act to make further provisions for securing that safety, health and welfare of persons at work, for protecting others against risk to safety or health in connection with the activities of persons at work, to establish the National Council for OSH and for matters connected therewith. Nothing in this act shall apply to work on board ships or the armed forces. In the event of any conflict or inconsistency between the provisions of this Act and that of any other written law pertaining to occupational safety and health, the provisions of this Act shall prevail, and the conflicting or inconsistent provisions of such other written law shall, to the extent of the conflict or inconsistency, be construed as superseded. The objectives of OSHA 1994 are to secure the safety, health and welfare of persons at work against risk to safety or health arising out of the activities of persons at work, to protect persons at a place of work other than persons at work against risk to safety or health arising out of the activities of persons at work, to promote an occupational environment for persons at work which is adapted to their physiological and psychological needs, to provide the means whereby the associated occupational safety and health legislations may be progressively replaced by a system of regulations and approved industry costs of practice operating in combination with the provisions of this Act designed to maintain or improve the standards of safety and health. The Director General of Occupational Safety and Health Independent Inspecting Body and Certificate of Authorization are the appointed officers under OSHA 1994. As for the membership of National Council for Occupational Safety and Health, the Council shall consist of not less than 12 and not more than 15 members who shall be appointed by the Minister, of whom three persons shall be from organisations representing employers, three persons from organisations representing employees, and three or more persons shall be from ministries or departments whose responsibilities is related to occupational safety and health, and three or more persons of whom at least one shall be a woman, shall be from organizations or professional bodies the activities of whose members are related to occupational safety and health, and who, in the opinion of the minister, are able to contribute to the work of the council. Next is the general duties of employers and self-employed persons under OSHA 1994, which are to ensure, so far as is practicable, the safety, health and welfare at work of all his employees, and then to prepare and as often as may be appropriate, revise a written statement of his general policy with respect to the safety and health at work of his employees and the organization and arrangements for the time being in force for carrying out that policy, and to bring the statement and any revision of it to the notice of all his employees. And then there is general duties of employees. So the general duties of employees includes to take reasonable care for the safety and health of himself and of other persons who may be affected by his acts or omissions at work. Next, to cooperate with his employer or any other person in the discharge of any duty or requirement imposed on the employer or that other person by this act or any regulation met thereunder. And then to wear or use at all times any protective equipment or clothing provided by the employer for the purpose of preventing risk to his safety and health, and to comply with any instruction or measure on occupational safety and health instituted by his employer or any other person by or under this act or any regulation met thereunder. 
As for the safety and health officer in every organization, they are employed exclusively for the purpose of ensuring the due observance at the place of work of the provisions of this Act and any regulation met thereunder and the promotion of a safe conduct of work at the place of work. They should possess such qualifications or have received such training as the Minister may by notification in the Gazette from time to time prescribed. There should be establishment of safety and health committee at place of work. Every employer shall establish a safety and health committee at a place of work if there are 40 or more persons employed at a place of work, or the Director General directs the establishment of such a committee at a place of work. The composition of a safety health committee, the election or appointment of persons to the committee, the powers of the members of the committee and any other matter relating to the establishment or procedure of the committee shall be as prescribed. Every employer shall consult the safety and health committee with a view to the making and maintenance of arrangement which will enable him and his employees to cooperate effectively in promoting and developing measures to ensure the safety and health at the place of work of the employees and in checking the effectiveness of such measures. And then, a person who contravenes the provisions of this section shall be guilty of an offence and shall, on conviction, be liable to a fine not exceeding 5,000 ringgit or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding 6 months or to both. The functions of safety and health committee include keep under review the measures taken to ensure the safety and health of persons at the place of work, to investigate any matter at the place of work, attempt to resolve any matter being investigated and if it is unable to do so, shall request the Director General to undertake an inspection of the place of work for that purpose and shall have such other functions as may be prescribed. In the case of the notification of accidents, dangerous occurrence, occupational poisoning and occupational diseases and inquiry, it requires an employer to notify to the nearest Department of Occupational Safety and Health Office of any accident, dangerous occurrence, occupational poisoning and occupational disease that has occurred in the place of work. This Act also stipulates every registered medical practitioner or medical officer attending to or called in to visit a patient whom he believes to be suffering from an occupational disease or poisoning to report the matter to the Director General. As to whether a case should be notified and recorded in an event of an accident, the decision-making process consists of five steps. Step 1. Determine whether a case occurred, that is, whether there was death, dangerous occurrence, poisoning, disease, or an injury. Step 2. Establish that the case was work-related that it resulted from an event or exposure in the work environment. Step 3. Decide whether the case is an accident or dangerous occurrence or an occupational poisoning or occupational disease. In Step 4. If the case is an occupational poisoning or occupational disease, notify using form JKKP7, record and check the appropriate occupational poisoning or occupational disease category on the JKKP at form. Or, step 5, if the case is death, serious bodily injury or dangerous occurrence, notify the case immediately by the quickest means, then send a written report using Form JKKP 6 within 7 days and together with other case record in the Form JKKP 8. 7 days means 7 calendar days, including any holidays that fall within that 7 days. An occupational safety and health officer may, for the purpose of carrying out the objects of OSHA 1994 or any regulation met thereunder, at any reasonable time and upon the production of his certificate of authorization, enter, inspect and examine any place of work other than a place used solely for residential purposes provided that he may enter the residential place with the consent of the owner or if he has reasonable cause to believe that a contravention of this act or any regulation met thereunder has or is likely to be committed. 
and as for the liability for offences, for general penalty, fine not exceeding 10,000 ringgit or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding one year or to both, and in the case of a continuing offence, to fine not exceeding 1,000 ringgit for every day or part of the day during which the offence continues after conviction. And then offences committed by body corporate, every person who at the time of the commission of the offence is a director, manager, secretary or other like officer of the body corporate shall be deemed to have contravened the provision and may be charged jointly in the same proceedings with the body corporate or severally and every such director, manager, secretary or other like officer of the body corporate shall be deemed to be guilty of the offence. For offences committed by trade union, every officer, employee and person purporting to act on the instruction of any officer of the trade union shall be deemed to have contravened the provision and may be charged jointly in the same proceedings with the trade union or severally and every such officer, employee or person shall be deemed to be guilty of the offence. Offences committed by agent, a person who would be liable under this act or any regulation met there under to any penalty for anything done or omitted if the thing had been done or omitted by him personally shall be liable to the same penalty if the thing had been done or omitted by his agent. In the event of appeals, the minister appoint appeal committees. An appeal committee may, after hearing an appeal, confirm, revoke or vary an order made by the Director General. An appeal committee decide and communicate expeditiously its decision to the person making the appeal. The decision of an appeal committee shall be final and conclusive and shall not be questioned in any court. The Minister may make regulations for or with respect to the safety, health and welfare of persons at work in order to achieve the objects of OSHA 1994.